The Canadian Arts Network recognizes and pays respects to the original people of this land. For time and memorial, Indigenous peoples have cared for and stewarded the lands known to many as Canada so that each of us today can benefit from all the gifts the land provides. Out of respect for the rights of Indigenous peoples, it is our collective responsibility to critically interrogate colonial histories and their present day implications. We therefore work from the perspective of honoring, protecting and sustaining the land and the people who were first on this territory to move beyond acknowledgement and into the doing. Similarly, we recognize the impact of colonial history and structures on our own communities and of those of people of color. We extend a hand in partnership to those who wish to move beyond allyship to become an accomplice in dismantling them. Hi, my name is Sean Zhe, um, he, him pronouns, and I'm based here in Amiskwichi, Waska Eakin, um, uh, known as Edmonton, Treaty 6 Territory, and Métis Homeland. Um, I'm a filmmaker and artist and community organizer, and I'm, yeah, really, really pleased to be here. Hello, everyone. I'm Vicki Van Chow. I'm a filmmaker and arts administrator based here in Calgary, Alberta, also known as Mokinsis on Treaty 7 territory through funding support from Canada Council for the Arts and administration support from Festival Access Asie. The Canadian Arts Network has created digital content to guide, mentor, inform, and educate equity-seeking artists, cultural workers, organizations, and festivals in Canada. So this series of 16 digital literacy workshops will cover a variety of topics on business administration and legal considerations, introduction to social media and digital marketing, and encourage ways to decolonize in the digital space. So these workshops will be followed up by a series of community conversations and roundtable discussions with arts leaders to help us all learn from each other. So make sure to sign up at canasianarts.com to get links to all the online content. So in our next hour and a bit together, you will have the opportunity to hear from accountant Pradeep Kanchan. A graduate of McGill University and based in Montreal, Pradeep has worked with many arts organizations, including the Montreal Fringe Festival, Pop Montreal, and Vancouver Fringe Festival. Currently, he is the production accountant at animation studio ED Films, but he also takes time to prepare tax returns for artists in many different disciplines. Welcome, Pradeep. Thank you very much. Uh, coming here from Montreal, Quebec, uh, I am currently at the studios of the Community Digital Arts Hub here in Montreal. It's a new space for people who want to use a green screen space. So I thank them very much for this opportunity and helping me set up with this uh, awesome round table talk. So what are we talking about? We are talking about taxes. Hmm. All right. So as a emerging artist or artist who's in the midway or someone who's new to the whole concept of taxes as an artist, what are the three things you should care about? So right now we're going to talk about tax preparation. And I'm also going to focus on doing your best practices when it comes to record keeping. Because besides just preparing for taxes, you, doing your record keeping is going to be helpful for not only tax prep, but when you have grants to report to. Like, let's say you have a Canada Council grant, if you have a local grant from the province or your city, just preparing those documents, having those backups will be very useful. And will be useful if Canada Revenue Agency comes calling and be like, hey, you said you are claiming this, give us the proof. So I will explain how to be well organized for that also. So I'm going to share my screen right now. And I'm going to show something that hopefully a lot of people are used to. Right, see. Share. Okay. So can you... See this? Yeah. All right. So this is a standard T1 return that every Canadian who files taxes has to do. From an artist's point of view, who are you know, emerging artists or like practicing artists in the middle of the career, two things you should focus on in this tax return is line 13010, which says artist project project grants and the self-employment income. Now, 
income is anything which you earn from your artistic endeavor. So let's say you are a musician, you went on a gig, you got $200 for that gig. That's your artistic income. Same with actors who acted on whether a play, TV show, movie, you earn income from the thing, that's your income. If you're a painter, you sold your artistic paint and you earn money from that, that's your income. So those usually go in the business income section. Now I'm gonna click here and show this form, which I don't know if many people are used to or have seen before. This is the statement of business professional activities, which is part of your tax return. And that links to this business income line in your T1. Now, over here, it says business or professional activities. As an artist, you are considered a business. The CRA still recognizes doctors, dentists, psychiatrists, medical professional as professional income. So barring those old industries and old professions, we are all business income for the CRA's purpose. And like I said, whatever income you get, you enter that here, whether if you get a T4A or whether you invoice someone and get less than $200 or whatever, calculate all those incomes, they will form your business income for the year. And a special note is when it comes to grants versus income. Now, recently, I've noticed that the CRA has actually taken steps into separating what a grant is when it comes from Canada Council, whether it comes from your provincial granting agency, whether it's Ontario Creates in Ontario, BC Create in BC, I'm not sure what the Alberta one is, but across, the, across Canada, every province, every city, they have a granting agency for the arts. Back in the day, there was always this confusion, should I include grant income in my business? Now the language is, if you can prove that you've received an artistic grant for an artistic work, it doesn't fall as business income. It falls as grant income, which is the same as a scholarship or a fellowship or a bursary. So in this situation, yes, you will also record expenses for this grant separately. We'll get to that later. Now, we've talked about business income. The main thing, but to earn your business income, you have incurred expenses. What are those expenses normally? So I've highlighted certain lines, which I think a lot of artists use for their expenses. It's either advertising, it's either meals and entertainment, office expenses, which in this scenario means stationary and office stationery and supplies, which means supplies that you use as an artist. And I'll get into details afterwards. So professional fees includes any fees you pay to a legal person or an accounting person, management and admin fees. Let's say you're part of a guild or a union. Those would be your management and admin fees will go there. Rent, you rent out a space for your artistic endeavor that would be there. Any people you paid for producing your art, those would go under salary wages expenses, travel expenses, there's other expenses. These are the main costs I've seen that artists usually incur over the course of their year, trying to make art and trying to make money from art. So advertising is simple. You have a show, you have an event, you have something to promote. You go on Facebook, you go on Instagram, you print posters, keep those costs handy. We're going to you know, use that as an expense against the income you've made. Meals and entertainment. This is a tricky one because even though, let's say, you have spent money on food, whether it's at an event or whether it's working with someone and you've spent food, spent money on buying food, only 50% of that food is eligible for tax purposes. CRA only recognizes that 50% of that is for business and other 50% is non-business expense. And this is a rule, doesn't matter whether you are an individual or whether you're a company, this rule applies to everyone. So don't say that, oh, I spent $100 on food, I can get $100 for my taxes, it doesn't work that way. 
it's always 50% of what you spend on means and entertainment is considered taxable expense from CRA's point of view. And like I said, office expense in this context means stationary. So if you buy pen, paper, printer, ink, just regular stationary for your home office, it will fall under there. And this confusing language, office stationary and expense, always bothers me because it, they don't mean just stationary and supplies. Supplies in this scenario means the tools that you need for your profession. So let's say you are a painter. You need easels, you need watercolor, you need ink color, you need paintbrushes. Whether you are a digital artist, all those supplies you need for, I guess, subscriptions to Adobe or whichever software you use to create your digital art would fall under office stationery and supplies. Um, for filmmakers, I guess, whenever you buy, uh, what's a script? Didn't Adobe buy, a, buy that script uh, writing the program recently, Final Draft? Or when you pay something like that for a subscription like that, you would use that. So think about it like what tools you use to create your art. Buying those things would fall under office stationery supplies in this context. Uh, professional fees, like I said, if you use a lawyer, if you use an accountant, they would bill you, you pay them. That's the professional fees you incur. Management and administration fees. So like I mentioned before, if you're part of any guilds, if you're part of any union, so a lot of my actor clients, they're either part of ACTRA, Canada-wide, they're part of uh, Union des Artistes in Quebec. So they have a guild fee to pay them. A lot of them have management because they are under agents. Whether they're musicians, they have a management company. They pay their 15%, 20% to the agent. Those expense falls under the management administration fee. So other artists may not have that, but for a whole lot of them, this might be an expense that pops up. So good, something you do take uh, into consideration. Rent, it could be a space you rent out for drawing. It could be a space you rent out for practicing music. It could be a space you rent out for uh, your play that you're putting on. Uh, so think about rent as a specific space you rent out to practice your artistic endeavor. Um, salaries and wages and benefits. In this scenario, if you pay someone under you to help you out, so let's say you, you uh, uh, well, can't think of any situations right now, but there are some times where you have received money to do something and you're paying people out of that budget. That would be a salaries and wage you're paying out to them. Travel expenses, again, like if you're traveling for your art, if you're traveling to earn that income, you can claim that in this uh, form here. Other expenses, usually in the artistic world, I've found a lot of expenses fall under the other expenses category and I have to specify them every time I prepare a return. So if you read this statement, it looks like a normal like business that makes something and sells something. But in an artist's case, another expense in this scenario could be you purchase a book because you wanted to get inspired for an art form. You purchase a book to write your new book. So anything that doesn't fall under the major categories of net income and adjustments, uh, you can put it under other expenses as long as it's reasonable and you can justify its use for your artistic endeavors. And then we get to the classic calculating business home, use of home expenses. So if you do art in your house, you can claim a portion of those expenses for your income that year. So I usually say maximum 30% because that's reasonable in my point of view. Anything from like 20 to 30% is reasonably assumed you would use your home space to create art. So in this scenario, your hydro, your electricity, if you pay homeowners or renters insurance or homeowners insurance, mortgage interest if you own property, 
if you're paying rent, that would fall under other expenses. That would be part of your expenses for the year. And like I said, the key word here is reasonable expenses. So that's why I say claim 30% of your home as business use space, because that is a reasonable expense to claim. And if we want to get more detail, there's something called capital cost allowance. And capital cost usually means an asset you have purchased and you don't write off the cost in just one year. You spread the cost of the asset across multiple years. So the general rule is if you purchase something less than $500, it's an expense. If you purchase something more than $500, it becomes an asset. So let's say you purchase a nice video camera, $2,000, that's an asset for you. If you purchase hard drives for your computer, because you're a digital artist and you need to buy hard drives that year, they cost less than $300. That's an expense. You can just claim it as a office supply. So artists, they have like, depending on their artistic field, they might have some a big purchase to come. That would be considered an asset and that would use the CCA table to calculate the expense for one taxation year. So that's something your accountant will do for you. So just be ready with your paperwork and that's all you need to like show them. So now when it comes to expenses, you can either have paper expenses or PDFs because you receive receipts online. A lot of things are done online nowadays, so that's good. So it's easier to store that information on your computer or your phone. The main trick is to make the information available to you in an intuitive way. So I don't know what that is for most people. For me, I just name, let's say the year that it is. And I have a folder under the year which says expenses and any PDF, any uh, images that are for expenses, I just dump it there because I know it's for that particular year. If you have paper expenses, buy a bunch of these. These are your best friends. Any paper receipts you get, open it up, dump them in, and you're off to the races. So that's one other way to be organized. And being organized is crucial because I recently had a uh, incident with a client of mine. He messages me in December. He's freaking out because he gets a letter from the CRA saying, you owe us $8,000. So I go onto his account and I read a previous message in which the CRA requested him, can you please provide the proof that this 50,000 that you received from this Quebec-based arts organization is an artist production grant? And he didn't read that email. And so CRA thought, Oh, he's not proving it. So he owes us $10,000 extra. So when he uploaded the actual statement saying, yes, this is a grant from this artistic granting agency. It's for an artistic project. He uploaded it to the CRA portal. He also showed that he paid this money to some, uh, he got, he paid someone else to do handle his artistic project. CRA was satisfied with him and his tax bill was back to norm. So having your backups, having knowing where all your documents are is very important. Like I said, not just for tax preparation, but for granting agencies, but all, and also for CRA uh, situations, right? Let's see my script. Uh, all right. The other thing I wanted to bring up is GSCs, HSTs, and provincial sales tax. Now, if you are artistic, as an emerging artist, you don't have to worry about it because CRA wants you to get a GSC, HSC number when your artistic income, your business income is more than 30,000 net, or net 30,000 gross. At that point, CRA will ask you to get a GSC HSC number. 
And when you don't have a GSC, HSC number, the best place to track your income and expenses, you can use Google Sheets. It's free. It's a spreadsheet online. So plug your numbers there. Have your backups in your computer. Have your backups in this nice folio. And that will be where you're organized for tax season. That's where you're organized for your grants. If you are more advanced and you're actually paying GST, HST, sales, provincial sales tax, and are a well-established artist at that point, you could use accounting software like QuickBooks, Sage, or Zero, And that makes it easier for doing the GSE returns also, as opposed to the manual way. So those are the best tools right now, whether you're emerging artists or whether you're well-established artists in terms of tracking your income and expenses. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say in that matter for now. Uh, any other questions? Maybe it'll be helpful to kind of explain uh, the difference between net and gross. I think a lot of, yeah. Okay, all right, okay. So gross income is all the income you get upfront. So you did work, you paid $2,000, that 2,000 is your gross income because you don't know how much money you spent to earn that 2,000. Now, let's say you've earned $2,000 but you spend $1,500 to earn that $2,000. So then your net income becomes 500. So gross is what you received upfront. Net is what it, all the expenses it took to earn that income. That makes, brings you down to your net income. So expenses will always bring you back to your net income. It is impossible for your, net income to be higher than gross income. If it is, rework your file because that is impossible. Great, thanks. And uh, you know, I know you mentioned that uh, a lot of this um, tax keeping is for individual artists. Um, so we wanted to know from an accounting's perspective, um, what are the pros and cons of you know working and building yourself up to either a sole proprietorship or incorporating a business, uh, incorporating as a business as an artist? Okay, so the biggest advantage a sole proprietor or well you got to learn the differences a sole proprietor is just a person who has an accounting number so then when they get the gsc number it's quicker that way so at that point you have earned a lot of money so you're going to pay gsc at that point they will want you to register as a sole proprietor the main difference between a business and a sole proprietor is liability so as a sole proprietor, any business loss that you have or any business liabilities that you have becomes your personal liability. As a business, business liability is separate from the person's liability. So that's the main legal advantage incorporating a business has versus a sole proprietor has. So a sole proprietor really, you only register as a sole proprietor is when you have to register for GSC, QSTs, GSC, HSC, and provincial sales tax. And at that point, it's just a record keeping thing. So Canada Revenue knows that you are earning income as a specific artist, as a self-employed person in this field. The other, well, the other disadvantage a business would have in this scenario is talking about grants. Now, as an individual, whether you're sole proprietor or regular emerging artist individual, any grants you receive is not a business income. But in an incorporated business, any income you receive, whether it's a grant, whether it's a sale, whether it's whatever, is business income. So it is one slight disadvantage is in business income, everything is income. There is no separation of like, oh, what is considered business income or is considered a grant income of an individual. But the other accounting advantage of a business is a business pays less tax than an individual. So if you're a sole proprietor, 
your tax rate is your individual tax rate, while business rates are less than individual rates, usually, and to get, well, and the standard rates are much less than an individual tax rate. So you can get like, pay less in taxes if you prepare well. But to get to that also, the disadvantages, the amount of paperwork and scrutiny you have as a business. As a sole proprietor, you just say, okay, I'm a sole proprietor. You pay an annual sole proprietor fee of $40 to your provincial agency that regulates that, that's fine. As a business, it's high cost to set up your business upfront. So you need to get a lawyer to like prepare your business uh, memorandums of associations and whatnot. The registration, annual registration fee, depending on the business is anywhere from like $100 to $500, depending on what business you do. Uh, a lot of paperwork is involved when it comes to running the business, like administration point of view. So you get those advantages that a business has of, okay, less tax burden, but the scrutiny is higher. So once you get to a stage where as an artist, you are able to have a lot of people working under you, you are, your business income is like, let's say comfortably, comfortably 50,000 or more after all your expenses. At that time, people should consider, maybe I should incorporate as a business because you reach at a stage as an artist where yes, you are earning a lot of money and you have the time to like hire people to work for you, to help you out in affairs of a business. So if that's the general consensus that if you're earning a lot of money, you can spend that money on other people to help you out with your business. Um, yeah, I think, I think I'm trying to kind of grasp like these different milestones, if you can call them in terms yeah. of like the amount of income to then inform what kind of entities you should, you should consider. Yeah. So Am I hearing that um, generally if you are um, making uh, $30,000 or less, making in terms of gross, so all the stuff coming in, then uh, you, you don't necessarily need to, to move on anything. Um, but once you start making over $30,000 uh, just in terms of gross, um, that's when you should probably be applying for a GST number. Um, and that's when we and, become a sole proprietor. Yeah, position. and then also becoming a sole proprietor. So there's two kind of actions in that. There's yeah. like one where it's just like completely tax purposes where you'll now have to start charging GST to people. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, but the benefit is also you can start claiming your GST. Exactly. Um, yeah. and, and, and that's kind of sole proprietor. And then when you're in that stage where you're making uh, or you're billing over 30,000, um, if you're, if you're starting to make over that amount and, um, starting to incur like subcontractors or people that you're hiring and you're netting, um, so after all expenses and stuff like that, over $50,000, it might be good time to start thinking about incorporating. Incorporate. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so okay. it's, yeah, it's, it's a trajectory thing. Like as mm -hmm. an emerging artist, there's no point becoming a incorporate business as an emerging artist because no, it's a bad idea. It's yeah. too much work and it's not feasible for you. Uh, however, I've seen like certain grants will only pay incorporated businesses, right? Mm -hmm. So right. that gets tricky then. So at that point, if you're an emerging artist or just a like in the middle of the career artists, at that point it would be best to get in touch with the business itself to like apply for that grant. Yeah. Because I've seen that happen to one of my clients who they applied for a filmmaking grant, but the filmmaking grant said, this grant is only paid to an incorporate business, not exactly. individuals. So usually like a lot of people associate themselves with other businesses to like apply for grants or they just apply for grants that are available to individuals itself. Right. So like, just in terms of that paper trail, um, if, and 
if a corporation does get a grant and then that money from that grant money is paying an artist, yep. can that artist then say, you know, this traces up to a grant or it's because, yeah, you can't, right? You can't, so, you, you can't yeah, because, yeah. because it I, has to be claimed specifically directly by the, by by the, the artist, grant, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the artist is not getting the grant. The artist yeah. is getting paid for their services through they're the getting grants. through the grants. So they're earning income from this other corporation. So it's not a grant for the artist. It's a grant for someone else. Yes. And they're just earning money. So you have to be very grant. clear even because sometimes I think, um, especially with like the arts work, there's like a lot of people's names are on grants and stuff like that, right? So yeah. um, people have to just be very, very cognizant of... Uh, who is the fiscal agent? Where is the money actually going? Exactly. To? Yeah. Because they would be the ones that could only um, claim, if possible, that it was an actual grant, like yeah. you know, money, right? I mean, like uh, many years ago, a client of mine, she's part of a theater troupe. But when they applied for a theater grant, she got the money herself. So the T4A she received from the granting agency was under her name, which said the total 12,000. So this was before the whole clarification from the CRA where they said, oh, uh, artist grants is a separate thing. Yeah. This was in the previous times where CRA was clueless on how to deal with artist grants. So I had to show that the money came in in her business income and the money was an expense. So I had to show uh, in and out and that way the CRA was, okay, satisfied that, yes, okay, you've done the right thing. But now it's easier with... Yeah, can rules. you tell us a bit more about that? Is that, um, how new is this? Uh, Just last year. Yeah, so it's a brand new kind it's of... A, exactly, it's a brand new, like, yeah. where the scholarships, bursaries, lines used to be, yeah. it never mentioned anything about artistic grant lines. Yeah. And starting last year, they've explicitly stated that artist production grants would be treated as a scholarship. Okay. So, so is it just artist production grants? Can it also include grants that are like community grants or other types of grants? Like, like for example, heritage grants. Like, like I do a lot of um, like artistic production work, but I apply through you know, even like non art art arts organization grants, right? Like there's so I'm 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 yeah, like would that fall under that, that category? Is, that is tricky because the way the CRA puts the language is like any grant you receive for pursuing an artistic project. So if you get a heritage grant are you creating an artwork from this heritage grant? Yeah, or? yeah. Okay. as an artist. So that would be the gray area. You'd that would be the gray well, area. If you look at my application, it's like yeah. purely an artistic like output. So, yeah. And in that case, like I said, have the letter from your heritage grant. That's yeah. your backup. Because when you get the T4A, yeah. it just says the name of the granting agency and the amount. It doesn't oh. give any description of like what the work is for. So as long as you have the letter, from your granting agency saying this was for a specific artistic project. There's your backup. Sierra reads that they're like, okay, this person is organized. They know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So, so tell us a bit more about what advantages that uh, artists are now getting because they're able to um, put it in as like a grant, like a the the that expense line is like specific, right? So, all right. So, as a self-employed person. Doesn't matter if you're individual uh, artist or any self-employed individual is responsible to pay for their own pension plan and employment insurance plan, depending on the province where you are. So, like in rest of Canada, it's CPP. In Quebec, it's QPP that we pay into as self-employed individuals. So, if you show the artist grant in your statement of business income, your CPP payable increases. But now you're showing that as an income outside of the business income statement. So you're not paying extra CPP towards that money. So that's the accounting advantage from it. So your accounting liability 
reduces because of that. Right. So, um, so you you basically will end up paying less back when, exactly. when, when you get your tax return. However, it still is included in your total yes. income. And as long as you can provide reasonable expenses against that grant. So that scholarship grant line, there's already a $500 reduction automatically. And uh, let's say if your grant is 5,000, if you can reasonably prove that you're spending the remaining 4,500 this year and next year, you can zero it out. So most of the time, most artists, they either use the grant in the year it's granted or the preceding year, right? So it's safe to assume that you're gonna spend all that money. So it's reasonable to assume that that grant amount is zeroed out. CRA just needs to see that you're declaring it and that you're reasonably claiming it as an expense. So you're zeroing it out reasonably. So it comes in and it goes out because you're spending all that grant money in creating your artistic endeavor, right? So, mm -hmm. or, yes. or in an other case, let's say of the grant money you received, you kept 500 for your cost of living expenses. You can say, okay, I've spent, I received a grant for 5,000. I spent 4,500 on my endeavors. I gave myself $500 as cost of living. And you show net of $500 at the end because 5,000 minus your 500 is expenses or is the deduction limit. And 4,000 you spent on external people. So that's a net 500 benefit for you. So you pay for taxes on the $500. Hmm. And just, um, yeah, that kind of leads into a, a, a question sort of um, kind of talking about how a lot of the artists are working in sort of di different disciplines with expenses and revenues just coming from many different sources. So, you know, whether they're from grants or just contract work or a job in a completely different field. Um, you know, what are some strategies? And I know you talked a little bit about this as well in helping to organize all those that the record keeping for, you know, artists who wear a lot of hats, like how do you separate this is this is expenses that are only related to this grant and this is related to my contract work and this is completely related to something completely outside of my artistic practice. So so that I mean that has to come down to the artist and how disciplined they are. Right, because I can tell you strategies, but like they have to do them. So it's always do what's easiest for you, like what's intuitive for you. So for me, if I have a paper receipt, I write down what it's for. If I have a digital receipt, whether it's a PDF or a image file, I will try and organize it in files in my computer relating to whatever activity. So. It has to be intuitive for the artists, like what comes naturally to them. Cause like this, like you can't teach them a single way if it's not intuitive and expect them to follow. It has to be something that they intuitively understand. Okay, I received $2,000 for this dance performance. I'm a dancer. So every dance, everything that's related to dance, they can file it under a file called dancing, dancing income. If they are a painter on the side and they sell their paintings or they sell their services as a painter, have a separate folder for painting income expenses, file everything there. If they want to buy multiple of these to track their expenses, write what the expenses are, it has to be intuitive to them and they just need to follow through. They just have to have the discipline to do it. Funny thing is, a client of mine joked that he wants to have a shoe box in front of his apartment with a hole in it, so it's like a postal box. Every time he walks in, if he has any receipts, he writes down what the receipt is for, deposit it in his shoe box, and at the end of the year, they would organize the shoe box to be like, okay, this is this expense, this is that expense. So if that is something you want to do as an artist, go for it. It's like, you know, it's free advice. Like If it's intuitive to you, go for it. So do things that are intuitive for you. So be organized, but be organized in a way that you feel comfortable doing it. So you will continue doing it. It's, 
it's not about like what to do. It's about being consistent with it and being patient with yourself. Cause like, this isn't like, you know, this isn't fun, right? <laughs> this isn't, this isn't art. Like organizing stuff isn't fun, whether you're like organizing a party, organizing whatever, you just have to be patient. You just have to like do it and, you know, make it a habit. So I'm um, speaking of um, being diligent and organized. Um, what are some like key, um, like uh, dates that we should be really like attuning to um, mm -hmm. like when should you know because there's like a site you know there's the yearly cycle and so maybe um, just right. kind of remind us like when should we really start like crunching the books and like you know like th those types of milestones yeah those kind of scheduling points so the CRA April 30th is the tax deadline for everyone who has tax payable. So if you owe taxes at the end of the tax year, April 30th is the day where you will do your return and pay your taxes on that day. Uh, if for artists, for self-employed individuals, they are more lenient and they're given the date of providing your tax return by June 15th. However, they still say, if you think you owe taxes by April 30th, just pay the amount first, give your return afterwards. June 15th is your deadline. So June 15th is as an individual, as a self-employed individual is your deadline. But if you are, let's say, earning 80% of your income as a salaried employee and only 20% of your income is uh, as a self-employed person on the side, do your tax returns, file them before April 30th and like pay your taxes if you're due any taxes to pay before that. Cause like, you don't, they don't expect like two separate returns from you. One from your salary side, one from self-employment side It's just one tax return they expect from you. So, but if you are just a self-employed person, you have until June 15th to file your taxes. But if you think you owe any taxes, just pay them ahead of time. And then that comes back to like, let's say if you're earning a lot of income and the CRA sees that you owe more than 3000 in one tax year, they will ask you to pay tax installments and they will tell you the amount themselves. So tax installments is a quarterly thing. So they will ask probably the first tax installment in September 15th, because you file your taxes on June 15th. And then they'll expect you to pay your tax is the installment on December 15th, March 15th, June 15th. So it's uh, every three months, every quarter, every, every three months, they ask you to file your taxes, uh, pay taxes in advance, because they also want you to get a small tax bill, the same way how salaried people who have their taxes directed at source pay off. So that's the idea of like them requesting you to get a tax uh, advance paid. Yeah, thanks for those clarifications. I know, uh, you know, financial literacy is not the, you know, most fun thing for artists having to tackle. And, um, you know, being someone who's really sort of immersed in the arts community and, um, you know, have worked with a lot of artists in different org arts organizations, you know, what do you see as like barriers um, in navigating this financial system to, uh, as it is today? And, you know, are there any changes that you hope to see in the future that will allow for more financial literacy um, in the arts? I mean, me personally, I think it's not just a thing with the arts, with artists themselves. It's just, Financial literacy in general is not relatable to anybody until it happens to them, right? So like when like when you were in school, you didn't think about like being an artist. You were just like, I'm in school, let me just finish school. If you were taught financial literacy at school, it's another language to you because like, what does debit card mean? What's a credit card mean? I don't know, I don't care. What, is, what do grants mean? I don't know, I don't care. So until it happens to you, until it becomes relatable, that's when people realize, okay, they need financial literacy. So the main dilemma is 
how do you make these things relatable to people? Like right now, emerging artists, I've tried to show things on the recording. Hopefully, like once they refer to this video again and again, it becomes relatable. It makes them understand, okay, this is how it works. It's easy. But like if any other layman who just sees that recording, it's not relatable to them because they don't care or they don't want to care. So it's that's the main barrier. It's how to make financial literacy relatable to anyone. And that's the philosophical question I've been like, de like debating myself. So it's it's hard because like, uh, like first of all, like talking about taxes, that just scares people. You say the word tax, doesn't matter if it's GST or income tax, it just scares people because they think taxes are bad, but like taxes pay for a lot of things. They pay for the grants that a lot of artists apply to. So, you know, it's, the question is how to demystify and make it relatable that I honestly don't have the answer to right now. I wish I did, but yeah. And if artists are sort of seeking the services as an accountant to kind of help them through kind of navigating the system, um, uh, you know, what should they be looking for in an accountant uh, who kind of will be able to understand sort of, as you mentioned, you know, there's a whole different language that um, ac accountants use when dealing with taxes, but um, it's the same with artists. How, what's a good strategy in finding an accountant that kind of can understand sort of the arts industry as well as like navigating the system to benefit artists? So like I said, it's, I mean, yeah, the lingo is different, but like the principles at the end of the day are the same, right? Like you earn income, you paid people, you incurred expenses and paid to earn that income. So as long as you are organized in your paperwork, in your like files that, yeah, I paid for advertising, I paid X amount for buying these supplies, I paid X amount. As long as those are simplified, hopefully any accountant should help you out. Any accountant who knows, like, because like, it's not that difficult to like, understand these things. It's just a question of relatability, right? So as long as you can, you know, group, like make your expenses relatable to the business income statement expenses there, any good accountant will like do your taxes for you easily. It's just a question of like you being consistent with your reporting. And like, like I said, the grants thing, that's the new thing. So I don't know how many accountants even bothered looking at that. So, so let's say if they find an accountant who knows what artist production grants are, that's a good start. Let's, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, I think it, it, it's, I mean, I think that it's a new concept for me too, because I do a lot of my own books. So I'm like, I, I need I, I probably need to like remind my accountant and just be like, oh, did we, are we going to do that this year? Um, uh, Cause some of my funds do come from grants. Mm -hmm. I, what is the difference? Like even that term like grant versus a commission. Cause like you could, you could get a commission or a grant mm -hmm. from the same organization. So, right. it, and, and both of the outputs could be for an artistic production. So it, it, it does is that language very specific like what exactly um signals what is a grant versus because you know some people can get hired to do the work that they've always been doing versus right. like you applying for a grant and then getting a grant right so i'm yeah mm. <laughs> so i mean that's a good question that's tricky because like all right, if okay from my understanding let's say if someone uh, came to you and were like, oh, we are commissioning you to do something for us, you've earned that income there. That's an income for you. Cause like you didn't apply for any grant. There was no paperwork involved and you did application and you proved that this is my grant application that's gonna revolutionize the art world. And then they were like, we are impressed by your application. Here's 
your $10,000 grant, as opposed to someone coming to you be like, okay, we like your work, we see your portfolio. Here's a contract for like $15,000, do this artwork for us. At that point, you've earned that income. So I, I think that's, maybe that's where the line is, that commission is like, you didn't apply for it. They came to you and asked you to pro provide the service. At that point, that becomes an income, an artistic income, as opposed to you applying for a grant, trying to do something experimental or trying to do something else in your artistic grant. And they said, okay, we like your project and we're granting you X amount of monies. Right. Um, just to get deeper, and I hope I'm not getting like too like complex about it, because even some commissions are proposals. Like you have to like, um, like some of them, they still have that level of competition. Like there's a call for, you know, proposals and then you finally, you know, they pick. And so the language may be different. And I, and I also do wonder, like, mm. I, like, I don't even know if I can say for sure, um, some people just may use the word grant. However, does that yeah like what's the, you know what i mean like, that, that, like that are there a... any like specific like legal implications there now that it, it's its own kind of budget line right like because i like how yeah i, I i'm very curious about that because you, you like as artists we're always like applying for you know proposals and grants or whatever i mean of course like yeah i feel like the the processes can be kind of similar mm. I wonder if like, yeah, if the artist production grants are are like specifically from the that particular funding body and only to that particular stream and any request for proposals or any like commissions that maybe sometimes are coming from that same um, funding body that would just be considered just your like a contract work, like a business so it'd be through the business income instead of that um, that scholarship line, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, because I, let's say a call back, a lot of grants, uh, this is a very tricky question. It's a good, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, yeah, like, exactly. what, like, is, what is a commission, what is a call for proposal for X as opposed to any granting agencies giving, yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny because I'm currently working on um, like a project where I'm where we're co-curating and then commissioning some works. And so we have the ability to do to to commission this through an actual arts grant. But the 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 artists that applied for it, they just like they would apply for a grant have applied for this and then have been selected so mm -hmm. does that discount those artists from be able to put that into the grants line simply because we use the word commission like if we had called it we are doing micro grants for example mm -hmm. in our call out does that allow them to then put it in that budget line or is it simply because we call it a film commission <laughs> right <laughs> it's it, it's interesting and so i like i do wonder whether or not even using the word grant does that have to be like from a very specific funding body or not necessarily right it doesn't have to necessarily trace back to like for example governmental funds does it not necessarily it's uh so the way I interpret the line is if it's creating a specific artwork, it's a grant. If let's say it was, let's say it was a travel grant for you to travel to, let's say, uh, Asia for promoting your artwork, that won't be a artist grant because that is not, because that is a cost of living expense there, right? Because that would be that would be an expense for you had you not received that grant to travel to a certain place. So that is an income at that point. Interesting. 
So as long as you're producing an artwork, so let me uh, share my screen here for a second. So an artist's production grant is typically paid in respect of a specific project. It's not used in the act itself, but it's amount that's used to be an artist or a writer in the production of a literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic work. So when you travel and you receive a travel grant, that is an income. That is not a artist production grant because you didn't create. This is my understanding from the CRA's uh, folio. So as long as an artistic work is being made from the commission or the grant, they can reasonably say, yes, this is grant money and then apply any uh, eligible expenses against them or, yeah. So it's not, it's not, it's not too specific in terms of the actual term grant, right? No, it's not too specific. It's yeah. It's more language, around like it has it, to be an artistic production. Artistic production. Yeah. And That's... like somewhat of like a um like there was some sort of like proposal or like some sort of competitive aspect to it exactly yeah In so you yeah so well that's that that's that's great so i yeah. could tell these artists that we've we've um brought on that they can actually around tax time put that into that that section yeah, yeah. Okay. And like I said, like a travel grant would be an income because you're not producing any art. You're just like exactly. being sent by the agency to like promote your artwork there. That's just promotion work that you so would have done make, normally. Yeah, let's make it clear. When we say um, there's a special budget line for grants, we specifically mean production, art production of, grants. Yes. Art yeah. production grant. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Any other grants that just uh, for your, you know, for your living expenses, those are business income there. Mm -hmm. And it can be tricky because also when you're, um, like some grants are like almost all inclusive. Yep. Like you may be utilizing some of it to say it's, you know, going towards some travel, going towards this, going towards yeah. that. So at that point, I would, I mean, it's reasonable to assume that you're going somewhere else in respect, like producing the artwork, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so at that point, I mean, it's reasonable to assume that majority of the grant is for, let's say, yeah. producing the artwork, and let's, and if you want to claim like certain expenses as amount you want to be taxed on, then you can obviously do that with your accountant. So yeah. I mean, we just got into the weeds a bit, <laughs> but I think it also just shows that um, within this process of accounting, there's still a lot of explaining to do, right? Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Even in your very artistic journeys, um, you you may need to just kind of talk it out because it is like there's, you know, I, th I think that's, you know, such a beautiful aspect of being an artist is that we can kind of like have these kind of freedoms to 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 create in the way that we do. However, there's also a way to interpret that in like these like financial like literacy type of <laughs> engagement. So, thank you for kind of hashing that out with us. Yeah, I think it's a great place to um, to to wrap up some of the questions. And yeah, if our audience wants to learn more about taxes and record keeping for artists, uh, I'm wondering if there's any uh, recommendations you have for where they can go to learn more or any resources uh, that you think would be really great for our artists to, to seek out. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. If the artists want, they can follow CRA on Twitter itself. So they, it's a very useful uh, Twitter account. Like I've bookmarked a lot of things from their tweets. So it's very useful. So, you know, if artists are interested, like if they think there's something for them on the CRA account on Twitter, check it out. Uh, Carfac has an interesting like section for like 
tax time when it comes for artists. So I'd say check it out also. Um, they have inf good information there. And Canada government itself is offering like financial literacy programs online. So I'll share these links with you afterwards so people can find them uh, in the description of our video, I imagine. So that'd be useful because like the information is there. It's just that it's not advertised that well. So I'm trying my best to like, you know, put the word out there. Uh, yeah. So, and this financial literacy program is falls under a bigger money and finance section of the Canadian government. So like a lot of information is there. So find information that you think is useful for you and go from there. Cause like we're trying to make financial literacy as easy as possible. Sometimes it's like, you know, daunting and intimidating. So take it at your own pace. And the other option, I mean, the other resource is like your public libraries. Like I'm a big fan of libraries. I like my local city library. I like my provincial library. So libraries are paid from the taxes you pay. So use your libraries. That would be my you know plug for the libraries itself. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Pradeep, for all that helpful information. Um, uh, we didn't even get into too much about it, but uh, we'd love to hear a bit more about your artistic practice uh, or sharing um, any of the work that you kind of do. Well, I've tried, well, I would I've tried uh, writing for the CBC uh, arts competition. So it's like, just like short stories and whatnot. I submitted one, it came back, say, no, thank you very much. So I'm just like, you know, just, uh, that's mostly what I'm doing. I was just like writing stuff and doodling. Just like writing down my thoughts and seeing like, if there's anything to apply for when it comes to the non-fiction part and the fiction part. So that's really what I'm doing now. My future goal is to like make a documentary, but that's like five years down the line. So that's in progress. So yeah, those, those are the small artistic things you want to cite. So yeah, nothing like fancy or anything. So yeah. Well, I'm sure if, um, you know, this is uh, also, you know, part of your, your I, I'm assuming business um, to to help uh, artists and and folks with taxes and stuff. So yeah, let us know uh, where we can kind of uh, find you or you know like uh, contact you if we're kind of looking for your support. Well, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter. I think those are two good social media places because I don't find me on Instagram. It's like no, uh, yeah, Facebook no, no. So yeah, find me on LinkedIn, find me on Twitter and yeah, reach out to me if you need any help or any guidance and yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so we're really grateful to have the support of Canada Council for the Arts and Festival Access AZ uh, to making this Can-Asian Arts Network project possible. Um, if you are an Asian Canadian artist looking for more support, visibility and community connection, we'd love to invite you to join our free network at www.canasianarts.com and follow us on our social media platforms. Yes, we hope this online workshop has been helpful to your artistic journey. And, you know, we recognize there's much more to learn about record keeping and taxes. So for more in-depth discussion, you can log into Canadian Arts Network to access our online groups and you'll go to business administration and legal section and we'll see you online. And again, thank you so much again, uh, Prady, for joining us today and sharing your knowledge. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, this was it was fun considering what a dry topic taxes <laughs> and bookkeeping and record keeping is. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, the Community Digital Arts Hub here in Montreal for hosting me and providing with me with awesome audio video equipment that I don't personally own. So thanks to them, I'm here recording. And thank you, Sean. Thank you, Vicky, for hosting me. And hopefully, even if one person finds this useful, I'll be glad that this was like a very you know, profitable venture. So hopefully an artist would be inspired to be like, okay, this person has helped me with like the boring stuff of the art world. So that's a good start. So yeah.